One of, the, uh, one of the things that we do in a polite society is we create rules that kind of govern our interactions, right? So there's certain things that, that we kind of say are, are um, not on the table for public discourse. So as adults, we typically don't talk to each other, at least unless we maybe if we're close friends or something about some of those topics. The funny thing is that sometimes kids don't like they don't have those filters necessarily built in, and so they don't always read situations like maybe you're not supposed to say something or, or that sort of thing. My nephew, um, that kid from the day he was born was like, he never met any strangers kind of kid. You know, he was always talking to, to people and engaging with them. And so one day we were, we were walking in kind of this outdoor mall in Dayton, Ohio, and, um, and, and walking by some guys, and they were just outside probably off work taking a smoke break. And, and they were kind of there, and so my nephew, he was, I think, about, I think said five at the time, and he stops, he just starts talking to these guys, asking how their day was going, catching up with them, like, they're like in their mid-twenties or something like that, and they're just engaged with him, and he starts to walk away, and then he looks back and he goes, are you guys smoking? Like, uh, like <laughs> you know, and they're like, no, like, uh, what are you talking about? And his dad's like grabbing him by the neck, like, Argh! like, come on, you know? And, and sometimes kids miss those filters, but as adults, like, we, we understand, like, okay, there's topics that we don't discuss, like politics and religion. So context of church, we'll, we'll let the religion one slide for today. But we don't talk about politics and money and sex and, 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 and kind of these environments. Those are sort of private matters and private issues. Well, guess what? For the next three weeks, we're talking about politics, money, and sex. Um, and we're not doing this because we're trying to be edgy or controversial, but really because these are, these are subject matters that Jesus deals with in straightforward manners and, and, and in a certain level of frequency that, that might surprise you. More than that, these are topics that Jesus speaks into, at least in part, because he's asked about them. Because somebody comes up to him with a question. We're in a a sort of a subset of our series with Jesus that we've entitled Wrestling with Jesus, where we are looking at these moments where somebody brings a question to Jesus or they're debating with Jesus over these incredibly relevant topics um, in their culture and in ours. So we've looked at the topics of, of the kingdom of God and the questions that were asked about Jesus, about what is this kingdom that you're bringing in? And last week, we looked at the question of morality. What is it what does it mean to be good enough? By the way, if you missed the sermon two weeks ago that Pastor Jeff delivered on wrestling with Jesus about the kingdom of God, I want to encourage you to go back and find that on the Chapel Street Church app. Watch that one because it really is foundational for all the subsequent conversations that we're going to continue to have. But today we are going to look at and engage in a conversation regarding how Jesus informs our politics and what it means to be political. Just that subject matter alone, the sermon title makes us uncomfortable. We we say things like, isn't Jesus above all of that? Jesus isn't really political. Well, yes and no. I mean, when we say politics, when we, we hear that word, oftentimes what we immediately assume, what immediately comes to mind for us is partisan. We mean picking a side. But Jesus lived in a political world, as we all do, and Jesus engaged things like corruption, and he would call out abuse and oppression. Jesus, like all of us, lived in a time and an age where there was the authority of an established government, and yet he operated and lived out of a kingdom of God authority and purpose. I think we also squirm a little bit, or at least I do, because the political climate in our country is is so toxic right now. Because so much of the discourse around these issues has has been relegated to to name-calling and the civility of the whole thing has just gone out the window. In fact, I found one statistic that I, I found a bit alarming that in 1998, so just 20 years ago, a survey was done and it asked about opinions of people, how you viewed people in the opposing political party from where you identified yourself. At that point in time, 15% of those surveyed said that they viewed those people in the political party 
the opposite party of themselves as evil. Not wrong, not that I disagree with, but evil. That number today is, is uh, 46%. So, so nearly half of us view people who have different political perspectives as us, not as a, a, a disagreeing perspective, not as a alternative viewpoint, but increasingly about right and wrong and good and evil. And so what happens is a lot of people can look at somebody on an opposite side of a policy of them on the other side of the aisle and they see them as the enemy. And although this feels very much like a contemporary issue, like something we are just dealing with in our culture, things aren't as different as you might imagine when, when this question is spoken to Jesus and the climate that he is living in. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, we're going to pick things up in verse 15 through verse 22. It says, Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, We know you're a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You can't be swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he, and he asked them, Whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's? And when they heard this, they were amazed. And so they left him and went away. I, I, I want to, there's a couple observations I want to pull out today from this text. One is I want to begin with looking at a divisive question and then a revolutionary response and finally a greater hope. First, let's look at, at a divisive question. I don't know if you've ever watched like those law and order shows or in my head, like I, I picture it as um, the old Perry Mason shows. I don't know if you've ever seen like the old Raymond Burr black and white Perry Masons. Like my dad used to watch those for some reason. And, and the image in my head is, is it would, for whatever reason, it'd be like a day when I was home sick from school, something like that. Dad would come home for lunch. I could still picture like the little TV trays sitting there and he would turn on these old Perry Mason shows and watch them there. And I'd watch them with him as a kid. And if you've ever seen those, what inevitably happens is Perry Mason, who's the lawyer, the defense lawyer, would get somebody on the stand who appears to be innocent. He's defending the person who it seems is obviously guilty of, of the crime. And then he starts to ask them like this series of in questions. And each question sort of increasingly reveals the person's guilt, right? Like with each question, he's like, oh, but I thought you said you weren't there at this time. And they're like, well, it was, you know, and then he's like, but then it goes on and on and on until they sort of like in this outburst of confession. And oh, every Perry Mason show ends the same way. Somebody confessing in the court of law that they in fact did do it and their, his client is free. And this person sort of like bursts out like, you got me, right? Like I did it. I'm guilty of the crime. Like th this is, this is not unlike what we see these guys doing here with Jesus. They're trying to trap him in this question. In fact, at the very beginning of the text, we see the purpose behind their, their question to Jesus. The Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. There's a couple things I just, I, I want to notice here. First, what stood out to me, this is the flattery that they bring to Jesus. They approach Jesus and they begin their question by first offering all these expressive declarations of praise. You are a man of integrity. You teach the way of God. You are swayed by others. You're sort of above all of this. And what's interesting to me is either they're, they're think Jesus is, is entirely naive or that they are incredibly clever. But, but what stands out here is that what they say about Jesus is true. See, the issue is that they, they just don't get it. They, they don't believe it. And because they don't understand it, they view Jesus as this threat, and so they hatch this plan to expose him as a fraud. They, they, if they believed what they're saying to Jesus here, 
They, they would leave their worlds behind, everything behind, and they would follow him as his disciples. But of course, Jesus through, sees through their, their effort, and he immediately exposes the intent in their hearts, and he says, you hypocrites. Why are you trying to trap me? There's also then, in addition to this flattery, there's this really strange partnership that's going on here. Notice that the Herodians and the Pharisees are conspiring together to trap Jesus. And the irony here is that the Herodians and the Pharisees would have been on the exact opposite end of the spectrum, a political spectrum, and now they're collaborating. The, the Herodians supported and aligned themselves with, with Herod, with the king, and, and essentially then with the Roman Empire. So they are aligning themselves with the oppressive force that is ruling over Israel because it's either societally or economically advantageous for them to do so. But the Pharisees, on the other hand, they're all about preserving Israel. They're, they're, they're about strict adherence to the Mosaic law. So they, they resent Herod. They, they, they resent Roman rule over Israel. The, the, the Pharisees viewed the Herodians as sellouts, in fact. And yet here in this passage, they agree on one thing. Jesus is a threat. He, he's a threat to their power, he's a threat to their position, and he has to be stopped. And so we find them partnering together, even if at the cost of aligning themselves with a political enemy. And so they, they approach Jesus now to, to trap him with this, this loaded question that they ask. This is back in verse 17. He says, tell us then, what's your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Now, at face value, this appears to be a question about, about taxation and, and what's right and Jesus' opinion on that. But, but the heart of this question that they're bringing to Jesus is really an attempt to force Jesus to take a stand that is ultimately going to, to disqualify him in the eyes of his people and the people that are following him. See, the specific tax here that is referred to in this passage is what's known as the imperial head tax. So everyone that lived under the rule of Rome was required to pay one denarius annually, which one denarius is, is the equivalent of one day's wage for a minimum wage worker. So it's not the amount of the tax that is the issue here but rather it is the, the, what the tax represents. And, and so just for the privilege of being under the authority and rule, a subject of Caesar, you would pay annually one denarius to Rome. So the average Jewish citizen is hearing this question now brought to Jesus and they wanna know how he's going to respond. But in addition to this, what the denarius, what that tax represented, what, what isn't immediately evident to us, but would have been to them is, is the history behind this tax. Because when this tax was implemented in about AD 6, so about 20, 25 years prior to this, a man by the name of Judas the Galilean led an armed revolt. He, he forbid all Jewish citizens from paying the imperial head tax. He led an armed group of men into the temple and they, they, they purged it of all pagan foreign worship, got everybody out that wasn't Jewish, and he, he declared um, out loud that we would no longer live under the rule and reign of Rome, that God is our king and God alone. Of course, Rome couldn't allow that to stand. And so they sent their um, military in to do what they do, and the, the um, insurgency is pushed down, and Judas the Galilean is ultimately executed. Now enter Jesus. Jesus, who has been gathering larger and larger crowds because he's teaching about the arrival of the kingdom of God. He's gaining notoriety, and, and, and once more is just prior to this. Jesus in Matthew chapter 21, if you flip over there, you'll see Jesus has just cleansed the temple himself. He, he's just pushed out the money changers and, and these people who are selling things in order to gouge those who are coming to offer sacrifice. 
And so really this question isn't about its tax. This question is saying, okay, Jesus, you've done two of the three things that Judas the Galilean did. You've, you've cleansed the temple and you've declared that God is king and God alone. And so are you going to do the third thing? Are you going to tell us not to, to pay the imperial head tax? Essentially, they're saying to Jesus, Jesus, are you leading a revolution? Is this a revolt? And with that question, they think they've got him. Because in their eyes, no matter how Jesus answers this question, no matter what he says, they've exposed him, and ultimately they destroy his following. Because if Jesus says, like Judas the Galilean did, no, don't, don't pay the tax. You're, that's not something that you're due. Then like Judas the Galilean, the Herodians would have immediately gone to the authorities in Rome and said, you have somebody who's leading a revolt, and they would have sent in their armies, and they would have taken care of it just like they did before. But if Jesus says, yes, meet your obligation, go ahead and pay the tax, then in the eyes of the people who are increasingly gathering around him to hear about the arrival of the kingdom of God, Jesus would have been viewed as just another pawn of Rome. And he would have been exposed as, as a fraud. The people would have been demoralized and Jesus would have been dismissed as irrelevant. The Herodians and, and the Pharisees, they think they've got him. Choose a side, Jesus. Let us know where you stand on this issue. Because whatever you choose, it's ultimately going to discredit you. So now Jesus responds to their question, and he responds with a revolutionary response. A revolutionary response. Look again at Jesus' words. This is back in verse 18 uh, and following. He says, but Jesus, knowing their evil intent, says, you hypocrites. Why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, whose image is this? Whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed. And so they left him and went away. You see, we, we live, especially in the realm of the political we are very familiar with the non-answer answer, right? I mean, we, we've watched debates all the time where somebody's asked a very specific question about a very specific topic, and then we watch them circle that topic in very non-specific ways, and so to say a whole bunch of stuff and really ultimately say nothing, um, especially on the issue that they were presented with. Like it, it, it's, we're made to feel like the kind of we're being lulled into a trance so that whatever it is that I'm feeling, whatever, whatever my sort of perspective is on the issue is that you're trying to convince me that you agree with me. So it's kind of like, well, what do you think? That's what I think, right? Like we, we see this unfold all the time. See, Jesus here is, he is not giving a non-answer answer. He's actually giving a revolutionary answer, so much that the people, the very people who are seeking to trap Jesus, it says they walk away amazed. Did you notice that at the end of the passage? I think that that's significant. See, Jesus asked if anyone has a, a denarius on them, which there's actually significance in that. If you're, if you're in one of our small groups, read Laura Tarot's notes on, on that, because I think that's really telling as as well, and you can find that on our app. It's really interesting. But he asked about whose image and whose inscription is on the coin. Now, I brought uh, an image of a denarius here. This is an ancient denarius, and the image, that Greek word there is icon. Whose icon is this? Who does this belong to? That's an image of Tiberius Caesar. And then the inscription on it reads, Tiberius Caesar, son of God Augustus, Pontifus Maximus. See, this is what's really, what Jesus is setting up here is, is nothing less than a kingdom showdown. Notice the titles that are ascribed to, to Tiberius Caesar. It's king, son of God, because Caesar Augustus was viewed as divine in the Roman Empire. And so he's saying, you are the son of, of, of the divine Pontifus Maximus, high priest. King, son of God, high priest. Hold up the coin Jesus says. There's two claims to this position here, and this is the, the brilliance and the revolutionary nature of Jesus' answer. Because Jesus, what Jesus is describing here is a whole new understanding of kingship. 
and, and subsequently then a whole new understanding of the idea of revolt. Jesus takes the coin, and this isn't immediately evident to us in the English, but when he's asked this series of questions, goes back and forth, there's a, he changes the verb here. When, when he's asked the question, he uses the, the Greek verb dunai, which means to give tribute to essentially Jesus. Like, is it right for us to give our allegiance to Caesar? Is the question that's asked of him. Which, by the way, we have a tendency to do this politically as well. To align ourselves, give our allegiance to one group or another, and then whether it's inadvertent or I think sometimes intentional, we, we believe and we communicate that this is the party of Jesus. But Jesus here, he, he, he shifts this a bit. He takes the question that's been asked of him, but when he responds, he changes the Greek verb to apodidomai, which, which means to give back, to pay tribute to, to give what is due, essentially. See, do you see the shift? Jesus is saying, sure, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. It's, it's his image on the coin, after all but give to God what is God's. Or in essence, he's saying, whose image is on you? See, this is a group of people who would have been rooted in their understanding of the Torah. They would have known what Genesis taught, that man and woman kind were created in God's image. He's saying, give to God what is God's. Whose image is on you? Pay what is your responsibility to pay. Meet your obligation, give back what's due, but your allegiance, your worship, the ownership of your life, that goes goes to your God. See, when Jesus talked about ushering in his kingdom, when he talked about its arrival here, he isn't talking about this internal kingdom that will rule in kind of the private and personal areas of our life. It includes that, but it's not merely that. He's not talking about some inner peace that we all just live with. Jesus is describing a real physical kingdom that will confront real physical issues in our society, in our culture, in our world. It will confront issues like poverty and injustice and social and ethnic prejudice. It'll confront hunger and and oppression. And Jesus' first sermon in Luke chapter 4, when he's When he's describing the arrival of this kingdom, when he's talking about what he's come to do, he quotes Isaiah 61 saying, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. See, Jesus isn't describing, or at least he's not only describing a a, a spiritual freedom, although it includes that. Jesus is describing, he's talking about a a physical, societal, cultural freedom that, that he has come to bring. So Jesus' answer here to the Herodians and to the Pharisees saying, yes, I've come to lead a revolution, But the revolt that I will bring won't come at the tip of a spear, and it won't come by violence. It'll come through transformation. It'll come by those who are living in my kingdom, giving to God what is God's. Which ultimately then leads us to a greater hope. A greater hope. I I wrestled with kind of how to to illustrate this, and, and one of the examples that has always stood out to me in my mind and that I've always been inspired by is um, the person of William Wilberforce. If you know his story at all, he was in British Parliament in the late 1700s, early 1800s, and, um, and he got into politics, like so many do, because of the power and the prestige that he felt like it afforded him, and, 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 and it did. He was very successful at a very young age. And yet, in the course of his life, he was confronted with the gospel, and he came to understand what Jesus had done for him. He totally surrenders. There's this massive transformation moment in his life, and he surrenders himself to Jesus, so much so that he's, he's wrestling with what, where to go from here. Do I remain in, in politics and do what I've been doing? But really, he's thinking, maybe I should just go and enter into the ministry and, and preach the gospel, and he ultimately comes convinced that God has placed him in the realm of the political for a purpose. And, and Wilberforce becomes ultimately one of the chief voices that's leading the way in, in Britain at the time for the abolition of slavery. 
because not because of, of its political um, um, popular, it's not a politically popular opinion at the time. There's all sorts of economic concerns about what it's going to mean for him because he's a part of the kingdom of God and he looks at what's taking place and he looks at the oppression and he looks at the evil of it and he said, this has to be stopped. And so he's engaged in the realm of the political in order to usher in God's kingdom. And it takes years. And the fight is arduous to the point where his, his own health suffers. But he ultimately finds victory along with, with several others who take up this cause and say, we have to do things differently. This isn't right. I think of the example of the, the early church. In Rome at the time, the, the policy of exposure was common. Where if, if for whatever reason, if you had a child that was unwanted, you could legally take that child to, to essentially out to the wilderness to a place where, where the child would just be left to die from the elements. And this was absolutely legal and, and commonplace. Um, and, and the early church began to see this and, and understand it and said, this isn't right. And they didn't seek to pass legislation. They didn't seek to, to raise up a new political party. They went to the, the, the wilderness and they collected the children and they adopted them on their, at their own expense and said, Yes, the, the, these, these children who, for whatever reason, were deemed to have no value, have value in the eyes of God, we'll, we'll be the ones that respond. We'll be the ones who do things differently. See, as we, as we wrap up, I want to take just a moment to consider a bit further what Jesus has described here in these instructions to give to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's. What, what does this look like for us? Because I think what Jesus is describing for us in this text is, is, I would call it like a dual citizenship, but with a hierarchy. G Jesus says, yes, we are, we live and we operate in the realm of Caesar. And we cannot, and we're not called to escape the political. It's our reality. And yet at the same time, this is not where we place our hope. Timothy Keller, and he was uh, delivering a passage on this same interaction from the gospel of of Mark, he talks about three implications of this, this teaching of Jesus in the realm of the political world. He says, first, refuse political simplicity, which means reviews the tendency to view one perspective or the other, one party or the other, as the ones who understand and who align with, with Jesus. None of us get it right all the time, perfectly. And so he just reviews, refuse that temptation to oversimplify what it means to, to understand how we integrate kingdom of God activity and business into the world around us. But he also says refuse political complacency. He's saying that the, 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 the response to this is not to be like the Essenes in the, in the New Testament where we just run out to the desert and escape from all of it. And we just build a little community out there where we're just loving each other and we have no impact on the world. That's not what we're called to either. But lastly, he says, we refuse political primacy, where we elevate the political to the position of highest priority. Because we do not place our hope in, in a politician. We don't place our hope in, in a policy or in a party. Politics is a part of our life. It's a world that we engage in, but it is not the hope of our life. The hope of our life is in our King Jesus Christ, in the kingdom that he ushered in. It's his kingdom purpose, his kingdom world that he has called us to be a part of. So, so what does it mean for us? What does this look like? I think two things. I think it means we participate. I think, I think Jesus' instructions about the kingdom of God are inspiring people to be engaged in the world around them. We need to ask questions about how does our faith and our kingdom perspective impact and inform and, and our policies and our politics and our voting that's fair and that's good and we should do it. But secondly, I think, and this is clear in, in, in 1 Timothy chapter two, we pray and we pray for our politicians and, and I would encourage you this way. I would, I would say the more you disagree with somebody, the more you should pray for them and, and pray for them, pray good things for them, <laughs> just specify. See, our, our, our 
our greater, our higher hope is in Jesus and his kingdom. This is our greater citizenship. And make, make no mistake, Jesus is leading a revolution. The subversion of Jesus and his kingdom was no less real, but it was not coming by means of an army and, and, and an overthrow. It wasn't about getting that kingdom out. It was about bringing his kingdom in. And this is what he calls us to as his church. Instead of acquiring power, Jesus laid it down. Jesus took all that currency that, that we see as so important in our world of power and success and comfort and recognition and all of these things, and he turns it upside down in his kingdom. And he says, for you as the church, as members of my kingdom, live like me. Be like me. May Jesus and his kingdom reign here. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we, we have the ability to gather into a place like this and to look at, at challenging and sometimes difficult um, topics, things like politics. And Lord, we pray that, that, that in the midst of disagreement about how to accomplish certain goals and what most accurately will reflect your, your kingdom values and your kingdom purpose, I pray that you would unite the church around who you are and what you've put us to, here to do so that we will engage in the world around us, Lord, to ultimately accomplish these things that you, have, um, that you came to set into motion. Lord, build your kingdom here and use us in the process. Amen.